there we go. Uh, so I, um, I've been teaching at San Francisco State uh, as we're now all online. Uh, actually, this past year, I've been teaching also at a high school in Sunnyvale. A former student of mine is on maternity leave, and she asked me if I would teach her class uh, since it's all online. And I said, sure, um, not knowing that her class had five sections. So I'm a, a full-time online teacher for high school kids and teaching three classes at San Francisco State. But it's OK, because I love teaching, and I get to utilize stuff. Like As soon as I'm done with this, I will be recording a video of me making salsa and fish tacos for my high school class, which hopefully I will be able to recycle and use at some point in one of my cooking classes at the uh, at San Francisco State. So um, I was asked to do this. I've done several uh, uh, demos on Chipino. I, it's a great dish, A, to demo because it's, it's, it's very easy, although if you ever make it for people, um, never tell people how easy it is. Uh, it's, it's great because it's already very tied into the culture here in San Francisco and brings up um, or incorporates issues of utilizing local produce and local fish and, and local everything um, in a dish that's actually uh, very easy to make and, and, and quite delicious as well. Uh, and we sent out a recipe. Um, I'm going to follow the recipe, but I'm going to encourage you to, if you try it one time and follow the recipe, that's great. Um, but this recipe I've made, I know it works. Uh, but when I'm teaching uh, people to learn how to cook, I try to encourage them to sort of cook to their own palate. Uh, if there's, if you think there's, it needs more garlic, or if you don't particularly like a specific fish or whatever, um, feel free to change it up. Chipino is a dish that was created in order to use whatever was available that day. So there's no there's no like hard and fast rule of you have to have this, you have to have this, you have to have this. It's an Italian dish. It's not a French dish. So uh, like if you're making bouillabaisse, if you weren't using ricasse, they'd say it's not bouillabaisse, but it's uh, with Chipino, use what you've got, use what's fresh, use what you like to eat. Um, there's a little issue right now with crab. Uh, the Dungeness crab season hasn't really started yet. Um, so I have some, some stuff that's in the freezer uh, that I will be using. Um, ideally, it would be whatever you have is best. I, I meant to get down to the Pacific up here and get some Dungeness crab, but it was raining all weekend, so I didn't do it. Um, so I have some frozen stuff, but it's, uh, it's okay. So what I'm going to do is, is, is show a couple basic cooking techniques um, like how to properly cut uh, a, a couple of different vegetables for this. And then I will show you how we cook it, um, processing a couple different uh, uh, seafoods. And then while I put it on to actually cook, um, we'll have a little chat about, uh, about wine, what wines go with this, what wines um, uh, uh, work best. Uh, and I'll take any questions then, and then I'll show you how to plate it. And if you want to follow along with the recipe, you're welcome to. Um, if not, uh, again, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very nice recipe. I will say the last time I did this um, demo, I had my husband as the cameraman, so he was following with the computer. I now have it sitting up on uh, a, a case of bubbly, so I'll, I'll be my own cameraman, and hopefully it will work. Um, if there are any technological issues. I apologize now. But hopefully you can see that. Let's get that out of the way. There we go. Uh, so a couple of the, the um, techniques I'm going to show that are really basic techniques. Um, I'm going to use onion. I'm going to use fennel. And I have half of them because I will show you that um, chipino is basically a tomato sauce in which you cook fish. It's really kind of that simple. Uh, and in the, the, the vein of Martha Stewart, who I worked for for two weeks, um, I made a sauce yesterday that's already heated uh, because most sauces like this get better as they sit for a day or sit overnight. So I'm going to show you how I made the sauce yesterday. But then when I cook the fish, since I'll be eating this for dinner, I will use the sauce that I made yesterday. Um, so if you're following along, you're welcome to use it and it's great. But this is a dish that does get better as it sits for a day or two, like most soups and stews actually do. Um, but the basic little techniques I'm going to show you are how to um, get a really nice fine dice on these two different vegetables, how to properly uh, sort of mash some garlic, and then how to cut parsley, because a lot of people sort of just shred herbs without really doing it right and wasting a lot of stuff. 
what I'm going to do with an onion, this is half of an onion, uh, and the onion and the fennel, I'm going to cut kind of the same way, um, because both of them are striated. They both have different uh, uh, layers of onion and of celery. Um, you may have seen this done, or you may have done this yourself. I got that in the center of the board. There we go. Um, when you're cutting an onion, the trick is to use a sharp knife and to work really fast so that you don't let all of those sulfuric compounds out to burn your eyes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my onion and I'm going to make seven or eight perpendicular cuts to the board, but I'm not going to cut through the root. So I have all of these nice cuts, but it's still held together by the root. And I will show you, I'm saving all of my scraps. I have my onion skins and my fennel pieces because I'm going to put these all into a bag that I keep in my freezer. And next time I make chicken stock or vegetable stock, I've got vegetables. I don't have to use nice fresh vegetables. I've got produce, that way you're not wasting anything. Um, and once I've made those little cuts, I'm gonna make one cut that's parallel to the board and then keeping my fingers nice and tight and tucked under, I'm going to cut perfect little squares of onion. The point being, you don't want to sit here with an onion and start doing this because the more you do this, the more you're mashing it and you're letting all of that, those fumes out and that's what's going to burn your eyes. I can feel it burning my eyes already. So I pick it up, I put it into a bowl, and then the fennel, I'm going to do the exact same way. Fennel is, it's a local vegetable. Um, it tastes like black licorice. Um, it's called anise in, uh, in French. Um, and I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to do a couple, that knife could be sharpened, that's making a noise, a couple perpendicular cuts, put my hand there, make one parallel cut. And then I'm going to get some nice, beautifully diced fennel. I take the root end, I throw it into my bowl. Actually, I don't even need to do it since I have it out. I'm going to put that into my bag. And then next time I make my chicken soup, I've got my aromatics that I can use for my chicken soup. Looking like I need to do that. Whoops. So I've got my onion and I got my fennel. The other two things I'm going to show how to cut are garlic. I'm gonna leave one garlic piece whole because I'm going to steam my mussels with that. And then I'm going to mash the other one that's gonna go into the chipino. And the easiest way to smash garlic, I don't like using a garlic press because I find a lot of the meat gets left in the garlic press. The easiest way to mash garlic, if you don't want to end up smelling like garlic, is take your knife and use the blade of your knife and just kind of massage the garlic against the board. It gets all of the juices out. It makes a beautiful mash. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. It's nice and mashed up, nice and fine, and my hands don't reek of garlic. So I'll put that into my little bowl. I'm gonna give it a little wash because the next thing I cut, I don't want to necessarily taste like garlic. And then what I'm gonna do with my parsley, again, parsley is another thing that you see people sometimes smashing, smashing, smashing a lot. The best way to cut parsley while keeping it nice and fresh is to roll it into a little ball and then very casually, just dice it up like that. If it's still a little big, you can sort of uh, gather it up again and make one more little cut. Again, the point being, I don't want to take my parsley and go like this. If you end up with a lot of green on your cutting board, that's the flavor that you're losing. So the more juice, the more stuff, the more chlorophyll you keep in your parsley, the fresher and better it's going to taste. That garlic was really pungent and oddly is burning my eyes more than the onion actually did. So I've got nice, roughly chopped parsley that's still gonna be nice and flavorful. And for this, since it's a garnish that we're just gonna sprinkle on at the end, I wouldn't recommend using dried parsley. Um, it's not pretty. 
This is really, it's not really for the flavor. It's just for the, um, for the color and to give a little brightness and freshness to the, to the soup. As I mentioned um, in the recipe, I'm just using fennel and onions. If you wanted to put in some carrots, you certainly could. It's gonna make a, a deeper, um, uh, sort of a more hearty uh, uh, tomato sauce. If you wanted to put in, if you wanted to put in 10 cloves of garlic, you're welcome to put in 10 cloves of garlic. If you love garlic, um, I like moderate amounts of garlic. So I'm just gonna use that rather large one. Um, celery, you could certainly put in. And uh, something that you also find uh, often in Chipino would be a pepper. Um, if it were pepper season and you're getting really beautiful, nice green or red or yellow bell peppers, um, by all means, um, dice them up so they look like that and you could put them in there as well. Um, I didn't see any that looked really all that great so I didn't put a pepper in there um, and often don't do it with a pepper. And then the main ingredient is tomatoes and these are canned tomatoes. I used, uh, uh, they're called San Benito tomatoes. Um, they're organic from the, from the um, San Benito Valley. Uh, these were whole tomatoes that I just stuck in my hand and I just crushed. I like to buy the whole tomatoes because you, you, you tend to get a better quality product than buying the ones that are already pre-diced or pre-crushed, but that's, it's kind of up to you. There's enough other stuff in here um, that if it's easier and you don't want to really squish the tomatoes yourself, they work. Um, and then there's some tomato paste worked in there as well that I stirred around with all of the juices. So I have the... Um, I'm gonna get this going so it can cook before I show you how to start the seafood. Let me move everything out of the way. Got to do a little maneuvering of the computer. Turn on my light. There we go. Hopefully my computer is clean. Awesome. I'm not my computer, my oven. There we go. So I'm gonna start out with some low heat, not low heat, medium heat. Um, I have a nice olive oil. It being Italian, you wanna use olive oil in this. And again, the idea is I'm just building a tomato sauce and this tomato sauce is what I'm going to cook my seafood in. Uh, technically, that's really all we're doing here. And the tomato sauce can taste how you want it to taste. I love fennel, so I tend to put in a lot of fennel. Um, I know people, my husband being one of them, like doesn't particularly care for fennel, but he can have pasta tonight. <laughs> and then I want to sweat them. The idea is you want to sweat them, not really saute them. The difference being when you are sweating a vegetable, it should be over moderate heat. And all you're doing is having the, the water in the vegetable evaporate without changing color. If I was sauteing them, I'd want them to get a little bit brown. It's, it, it, I think, makes the, it taste a little bit um, uh, uh, deeper. It goes better with, um, with beef than it does with seafood. But when you're sweating, if you're allowing the liquid, the water to evaporate, you're concentrating the flavor of the vegetable itself. That's the difference when you see written in a recipe to sweat rather than to saute. It takes a little bit longer but it develops the flavor of the vegetable. In other words, when you're sweating a vegetable, you're sort of accentuating the flavor of the vegetable itself. When you're sauteing a vegetable, you're caramelizing it. You're actually changing the flavor of the vegetable. I'm gonna let this go for a minute or two. Smells really good. While that's sweating, I'll give a little bit about the, um, that's bad lighting. Uh, about the wine that I'm using. Uh, the recipe actually says a fruity wine and I do need to change that. This works better with a dry white wine. Um, like anytime you're talking about wine, it really comes down to kind of your own personal preference. Um, but wine enthusiasts um, who are into the chemistry of why things work and taste the way that they do, sometimes can get a little bit 
I don't want to say arrogant, um, but can say, uh, you know, say you must do this or this wine must be used with this or you can never mix these wines with these foods. Um, as a cook who wants food to taste good, I like to accent or to, 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 to uh, accentuate more that you should take a wine that's going to complement the food. Um, this is an acidic tomato sauce. It's very fruity with all of the vegetables in it. It's got the bay leaf. It's going to have some sage. Um, so you want a wine that's, that's just kind of giving you a little bit of acidic component without too much added flavor. So a Chardonnay that's very buttery and very oaky would kind of overpower a lot of the stuff that's in here. And I'm going to actually add the wine now. Where do I have it? This is a cup and a half of wine. Um, and it's a dry Italian white. It's a Pinot Grigio. This is an Italian dish. Um, well, it's an American dish, but it's an Italian heritage. Um, so Pinot Grigio, it goes great because it's not particularly fruity. It's not particularly sweet. It's not oaky like a Chardonnay. It's not grassy like a Sauvignon Blanc. So it's just a really nice sort of bracing acidity that it adds to the, uh, to, to the soup that complements the fish, I think really well. Um, if you like Chardonnay and you like that buttery oakiness, you could certainly try it. Um, but as it reduces down, it's going to get butterier and it's going to get oakier. And um, I don't think is really the best wine for a dish like this. So when I'm cooking with white wine, I tend to gravitate towards a Pinot Grigio. They're inexpensive. Um, they're drinkable. Like whatever's left there, I can drink. You don't want to work with the wine that you don't want to drink. Um, and it's just giving you some nice acidity rather than giving you over, over sweetness or too much oaky or anything like that. And we're going to let that reduce down a little bit. While it's cooking down, I'm going to actually add my garlic. And I add the garlic to the liquid rather than sauteing it because garlic is very high in sugar and can burn very, very easily. So I tend to like garlic, add garlic to, um, to the liquids rather than to the fat and the high heat of the, of the sweating. And while I'm also doing that, I'm going to add in my bay leaf. This is a fresh bay leaf. I have a bay leaf tree in my backyard. If you've never worked with a fresh bay leaf, be careful because they're very, very strong, which is why that's a small one. If all you have is dried, if all you have is store-bought, that's fine to, <laughs> to quote in your garden. Um, and then I have some sage from my backyard and a little bit of um, Italian crushed red pepper. Again, I add those to the wine as it's reducing so that they can release their flavors into the wine and cook for a little bit before I add my tomatoes. See, I could just cook seafood in this and that would be perfectly fine. It smells delicious. Any questions so far? No, we're doing good. All right. I'm gonna crank up the heat. I would do this over a low heat, but for purposes of the demo, I'm gonna crank it up a little bit just so it reduces. You can all see that. Let me move this in a little bit closer. Put that down. That's working. And once that gets, woo, just got some of the pepper up my nose. Hey, Tim. Yes, uh, sir. Daniel Snyder asks, the recipe had the bay leaf and sage added later. It did. Was that added in with the tomato sauce? I might have to change that. I would add it in with the liquid ingredients. You could add it in now. It's just adding it in with the with the, with the wine as the um, with the alcohol. It's going to help release some of the um, some of the juices. I don't think ultimately it would matter all of that much because this is still going to cook for a good thirty or forty minutes. So you're going to get enough of the flavor in there. Oops, that's boiling it back. There we go. So this is my tomato sauce. I've got the tomatoes, the tomato paste, the herbs, the garlic, the wine. The last thing we need now is my clam juice. Um, this is bottled clam juice. It's Bar Harbor. I like this brand. Uh, if I was doing this in a restaurant, I actually would use my own um, fish stock, which you just make by cooking fish bones the way you would make a chicken stock or a vegetable stock. And I'm gonna let this cook and simmer on the side of the stove. So this is what it looks like fresh before it's had a chance to reduce down. 
as I said, I made this one yesterday. This is cooked for about, I would say, 45 minutes or so. You can see as the water evaporates from the tomatoes, it kind of darkens and the tomato paste more sort of takes over. Um, the flavor is going to be deeper and that way that's going to, uh, that's what I'm going to cook my seafood in. So I'm gonna push this to the side, a la Martha Stewart. Tim, can I quickly interject another question? Yep. Um, Janet Thayer says she would likely be using dried sage. So she has a question about how much would you suggest to use? A general, a general um, a guideline for dried to, um, fresh to dried is, is for every tablespoon of fresh herb, use one teaspoon of dried herb. So it's about three times, three times less because one tablespoon is three teaspoons. So if I put in, that was probably, that was probably a good tablespoon of chopped up fresh sage. I would use a teaspoon of the dried sage and then taste it. And once it's cooking, if it's, if you feel like you need a little bit more, add a little bit more. Um, because again, that all comes down to your own sort of personal taste. Uh, dried herbs, if they've been sitting around for a year or two, are going to lose some of their potency. So you might need some more. Um, so it's not an exact science. Uh, measurements of herbs are very much to your own personal palate. Um, it's not an exact thing. Uh, different sages or different herbs are going to taste different depending on how old they are, how fresh they are, and lots of different variables. So I would start with a teaspoon and then cook it, taste it, see how it is, and then add more if you feel like it needs more. All right, so quickly, let me turn this around here. Uh, I have some mussels and I'll tell you the, the seafood that I'm using, let me get better lighting here, there we go. Um, I have, I bought some local mussels from Tamales Bay. I bought some, uh, uh, some Monterey Bay calamari. I bought some local lingcod and some petrale sole, uh, which are all local fish. Uh, and I did buy a frozen um, Dungeness crab quarter. Uh, I would have preferred fresh, but again, it's the, the season is not started yet. Um, it should have started, but there are a lot of environmental and political reasons why it has not. Uh, so everything is frozen right now. Um, you are welcome to use what you want. If you don't like mussels, you don't need to use mussels. I usually sometimes like to use clams, but the clams didn't look very good yesterday. They were the really big cohogs. I couldn't find the nice small clams. Uh, where do I prefer to buy fresh, fresh in the Bay Area? I uh, belong to a seafood uh, CSA. So every week I get fresh fish from local fishermen. It's like $24 a week. I'll actually even write it in here. It's called realgoodfish.com. Um, other than that, I like the seafood counter at Lunardi's. And I will say that mainly because it's only a mile from my house. Uh, <laughs> so I know Whole Food has really good fish, um, but there isn't one near to me. And the one in the city doesn't have really great parking. Uh, but I, I, I like going to Lunardi's. I like using the local fishermen. Um, there was a place here in, in uh, Pacific called Stuckey's that unfortunately closed um, uh, as a result of COVID. And that, that, would, that makes me sad. Um, so I tend to buy, I either use my, um, there's another one, four star, if you're in this, if you're in the um, Bay Area, it's called fourstarseafood.com. Um, full disclosure, he's a friend of mine. We used to work together in New York City. Uh, he was the sous chef when I was a line cook. Um, and they started, they had, they delivered to some of the best restaurants in the city. And when COVID happened, they started doing home delivery and selling to the commercial market. And they've got really, really good stuff. Um, really good stuff. It's not all local, but they've got really great local stuff. Um, and they've got a lot of stuff that you don't see elsewhere. And because they're wholesalers, they're a little bit less expensive. Like I got some, some uh, swordfish steaks from them that were like 14 bucks a pound. And at Lunardi's, they're like 25 bucks a pound. So um, those two places I would recommend. Um, and I also say Whole Foods, they do have good seafood. I just don't use them because I don't live near them. Uh, it's just really about location, location, location. So these mussels come from, I got these at Four Star Seafood. They're from Tamales Bay. 
And what I've done with the mussels is I've soaked them in just in cold water um, to get any of the shells to close and to kind of clean them off. Um, and with mussels, you want to go through and make sure each one is closed. If they're still alive, you I mean, if they're still open, you tap on them. And if they don't close, throw them away. Because one mussel that's dead, it will destroy your whole, um, your whole soup. Uh, if you have a little bit of this hair stuff that's coming out of it, this is basically just seaweed, but I like to pull that off. Um, it's edible, but it, it, it can taste a little bit seaweedy and give them a nice rinse. Uh, you will see some recipes of mussels uh, or for Chipino that says, just throw your mussels and your clams into the tomato sauce. I've done that. And if you have one mussel that's bad and it opens in your whole pot, the whole thing is destroyed. So I like to cook the mussels separately. I like to cook the clams separately if I had the clams. Um, and I will show you how we do that right now. It's very, very simple. Um, Here's my pot. If you can see, I have the heat on underneath my pot. So I'm getting my pot like ripping hot. In my bowl with my mussels, I'm going to throw in a garlic clove. And I'm going to put in, I don't know, for this many mussels, I just put in about half a cup of wine. So this is wine, garlic, and mussels. And once the pan has been on the heat enough, I'm going to dump all this right in and then close it really, really tight. Mussels cook in about 45 seconds if you do it this way. Um, I like doing it like this because if the mussels get overcooked, they start to shrivel up and they start to get rubbery. Uh, this way they cook and they cook sort of uh, quickly. If you're doing clams, clams can take several minutes to cook. The big clams can take maybe 10 or 12 minutes. The smaller you get, they cook in maybe two or three minutes. Nice little manila clams, which I was looking for yesterday, but couldn't find. Um, they take about two or three minutes. And you just wanna leave the top on, give it a little shake. And they're starting to open already. Guess I can move my little coffee pot out of the way. That smells good. If you were just doing the mussels separately, see how quickly those opened? What I'm gonna do is remove them while they're still nice and big and plump. See how nice and plump those mussels are? You get that in there. Can I get that in the camera? There we go. Um, just drip mussel juice all over my computer, but that is okay. And they're all open, they're all nice and steamed. I'm gonna set those aside. And then I'm going to take the wine, turn off the back burner, turn down this burner. And I'm gonna strain that into my sauce. That way you get some of the wine, you get some of the liquor. I'm not gonna go all the way because I can see a couple pieces of sand there at the bottom, but I'm just gonna add that and stir that up. Now, as I mentioned, this is this sauce 24 hours later after it cooked down for a good 45 minutes or so. What I'm going to do before I have a quick little talk about wine is I'm going to put in the seafood. And this, this is the local fresh Petrali sole. I left a whole piece because I have to do fish tacos for my high school class later. Uh, but just wanted to show you how beautiful that is. Um, here I have, I'm gonna add these first. This, the pink one is the Petrali Sole. The white one is the local Ling Cod, which had been frozen, which is why it looks like it has a little bit of freezer burn, but it was what was available. And this takes five or six minutes to cook. And you see it's on a very, very low simmer. It's just gonna use the, the ambient heat of the hot tomato sauce to cook. And then since my, my crab was previously frozen, I wanna get that in there too, just to reheat it. Uh, if you're doing a, a fancy dinner party, you could certainly buy the crab out of the shell. And I would stir that in right at the end um, because it could kind of get kind of messy when you're giving someone a whole piece of crab if they are sitting there 
trying to have a nice dinner. So that's what it looks like as it's simmering. As I said, we're just cooking fish in a tomato sauce. Crank up the heat a little bit. That looks really good. I'm gonna bring my camera back to my cutting area and answer any questions or talk a little bit about the wine. Let me show you that Petrali Soligan. That is beautiful fish. This was local, caught probably over the last day or two. Maybe, maybe not on Saturday since it was raining. A lot of fishermen don't go out when it's raining. So to kind of recap, wash off my muscles. We've made a tomato sauce with the flavors of bay and sage. And uh, again, they're not necessary, but they're very traditional in this dish because they're local to the Bay Area. Um, bay leaves grow on the side of the road and sage is everywhere. Um, not, they're not all culinary, but they're, they're flavors that are here. Um, if you wanted to put in some basil, you certainly could put in some basil or some oregano. Um, I love bay and I love sage, which is why I'm just working with those two. Um, the fish are the ling cod, the crab, the local calamari, which will go in very much at the end. Um, calamari should cook in two minutes or two hours, uh, anything in between, and it gets a little bit rubbery. So you want them to cook very quickly or you want them to cook for a couple hours if you're stewing them up. And then the mussels, I'm just gonna add in since they're, already, since they're already cooked, I'll add them in at the very last minute and then garnish it. Um, so to talk about wine real quickly, as I mentioned, um, this is a seafood dish. So it goes very well with whites. Um, it's also an Italian flavored dish. So there are certain reds that go well with Italian um, tomato sauces. Uh, I would stay away from things like that are too tannic, like a Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, even a Merlot might be a little bit too heavy. Uh, if you like it and you like that with tomato with wine or with tomato sauce, you're certainly welcome to try it. But the wines that are going to really go best with the acidity and the fishiness are going to be lighter, uh, lighter bodied wines. So if I was going to do a red, I would do like a Pinot Noir. Um, beautiful Pinot Noirs from California. Probably, probably my favorite wines are Pinot Noirs from Oregon. Um, but also there are a couple of red wines from Italy, like a Barbera, uh, B a R B E R A, which is actually from the region that the immigrants that created um, Chipino is from, from Northern Italy. It's a Northern Italian wine. It's very light, very fruity. It goes great with fish. Um, and it, it really accentuates uh, uh, or complements um, tomato sauce very well. Um, with whites, uh, I, I like Chardonnay. I don't really, People have their own uh, opinions. I don't like Sauvignon Blanc at all, um, but if people do like it, you're welcome to have a Sauvignon Blanc. It is acidic enough that it would hold up to the tomato sauce. I just find them to be very grassy, um, and I, I very rarely have a Sauvignon Blanc and I'm like, wow, that's a delicious wine. But if you like a Sauvignon Blanc, it would go well with this. I really, I just love Pinot Grigio's for a, a dish like this, and I love the really interesting um, wines, a lot of them come from the Monterey Bay Area, Bay Area like a, a Torontes, um, T-O-R-O-O-N-T-E-S, I believe that's right, and then an Albarino, uh, I don't know how to, oh, there we go, got the little Enye, Albarino, Albarino is a, is a Spanish grape that's very light, very fruity, um, and even, I would say, like a Gruner, Gruner Veltliner, um, is one of my favorite light white drinking wines. They're very acidic, they're very fruity, they're very, the Albarino is actually very floral and it goes really nicely with seafood. It doesn't overpower at all. I think Chardonnays overpower seafood a lot unless it's a really fatty, buttery seafood like a salmon or, or something like that. Um, so I would, I would very recommend those. Um, now that I'm saying Gruner, I, I like a Gruner, but I'm doing dry January, so I'm not gonna have any of them. Uh, but they, those wines think light. Um, and, and again, red is okay. If it's a light red, like a Barbera or a Pinot Noir, the heavier you get, the more it's gonna just overpower. Um, but then again, you're drinking it. So whatever you find that you like is, is, the, best, um, is the best wine. Um, so this has been cooking for a while. I'm going to move it real back real quick before I plate this up, because all we have left to do, I can see that the fish 
is white all the way through. Yep, if you push a piece up against the side and it breaks apart, the fish is cooked. So I'm gonna add in my calamari. This is local calamari. Um, what's maddening about local calamari is a lot of great calamari comes from the Monterey Bay. Um, it's smaller than a lot of calamari, so it's very nice and tender. Um, but because of the bizarre economics of seafood, a lot of Monterey Bay calamari is shipped to China where it's frozen and packaged and then shipped back to the Bay Area. Uh, um, so, and it's not calamari season right now, so there wasn't really any stuff. So this was frozen calamari that I bought at Lunardi's. Um, it was, is Monterey Bay, because uh, 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 you can tell by how small it is. Um, but the um, calamari cooks really, really, really quickly. So I'm just gonna let that sit for a second or so. And then I'm going to actually just add in my mussels with a little bit of that leftover juice. And as I mentioned, eh, I'm gonna leave that garlic clove out of there. There we go. Just kind of warm them up. I don't want the mussels to overly cook. Turn that down a little bit. And that, my friends, is tomato sauce with seafood. So bring it back over here and plate it up. I was thinking this was gonna be dinner. This might actually end up being my lunch. And then let's move that back a little bit more so you can see this. I'll do two different plates. One is just a plate plate. That's a bowl actually. And in my bowl, I'm going to scoop in a bunch of the sauce. It should be thick. It's sometimes called a soup. It's really much more of a stew, I think, if you want to be technical. I'm going to give myself a piece of crab, a little bit more sauce in there. And then it's not in the recipe, but this is one of my secret ingredients on almost everything. I like to take a lemon and then just a little bit of lemon zest right on top. You smell it like the second you put it on there. Beautiful taste of lemon a little bit of chopped parsley. I'm gonna do a little drizzle of my really nice olive oil. And then if I had made sourdough bread, I'd put a nice little sourdough crouton in there. I did make sourdough bread over the weekend. It was gone by Tuesday. I'm one of those people that started making sourdough bread in March <laughs> and now I can't stop. And then in this one, if you wanna do this as a Sort of serve yourself, pass around the bowl. I'm just going to put it all in here. Make it look nice and attractive. Uh, it's missing shrimp, but shrimp again, there weren't any real good shrimp. Um, there are certain things I just don't like working with, and the main one is farmed shrimp, um, and that's all I found available was farmed shrimp. There were some. Oregon pink shrimp, which are the nice small shrimp. Um, but I thought I had enough with this. If you like shrimp and you want to work with farm shrimp, you're welcome to. I don't. Um, again, a nice, uh, for environmental reasons and for human rights reasons, farm shrimp is one of the things I really just like to stay away from. Nice sprinkling of parsley. And then again, a nice drizzle of some olive oil. If I had some bay flavored olive oil, I'd put that on there as well. So there you go. You've got a platter so people can serve themselves. You've got a nice little thing that I will eat for my lunch. That, my friends, is how easy Chipino is. It's a tomato sauce in which you cook fish. It can be any simpler than that. Any questions? Tim, yes. could you take two minutes and, and talk about the origination of the dish, you know, sort oh, of? Oh, sure. Yes, yes. I meant to do that at the beginning. Um, Chipino is a dish that was started, uh, and I actually teach a course, I, I do this every semester, I teach a course at, at, at San Francisco State um, that's called Food and Culture, which looks at immigrant cuisines and how they change when they come in specifically to America, because we're looking at America. But things like spaghetti and meatballs that people assume are Italian that are very much American, um, chop suey, general so's chicken, 
uh, uh, foods that, that were brought to our country and now are very sort of looked at as a, 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 a people think they're still Italian or Chinese when they're very much American dishes. Um, this is a dish that was created by uh, Northern Italians. Northern Italians in particular um, came over, they were the first wave of sort of Italian immigrants in the 19th century. And rather than staying in New York and Boston, like a lot of Southern Italians did who came over later, a lot of Northern Italians came over in the mid 19th century and came all the way West because it just so happens they landed in New York and there was the gold rush in 1849. So a lot of people from Liguria and, and, um, uh, and Venice and Bologna ended up coming to um, the West Coast. So when you think of little Italy and, and Italian food in the Bay Area, it's very much a Northern Italian form of food rather than Southern Italian, um, which is what pizza and, and a lot of different pasta dishes are in New York. Um, so this is based on a Ligurian uh, from, from, from Genoa, the town of city of Geno Genoa um, uh, dish, uh, which is a tomato based seafood dish. Um, and it's called Chipino uh, because it, it, it's, it comes from, it's sort of a bastardization of the word that would mean something like, like chip in, like everybody, like the, the fishermen would go out and they'd come back and this guy caught calamari and this guy caught salmon and this guy caught some rockfish and they'd just go around and share whatever they got for the, for the day. And then they'd make a stew that was based on tomatoes because Italians like tomatoes and tomatoes are great out here with the bay and the sage and then whatever fish happened to be caught that day. So, so think of it as like the catch of the day um, that's cooked in a tomato sauce. Uh, and it's now, uh, again, people are like, oh, it's a great Italian dish. It's very much a San Franciscan dish that was created by Northern Italian immigrants from the city of Genoa um, who ended up coming out here to, to find gold um, and, and ended up making culinary gold. That was cheesy, I'm sorry, erase that. <laughs> um, so that's the history of the dish. It is really great and it, 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 as I said at the beginning, it's a great dish to show different techniques of cooking without having to be tied to sort of the, the, the dogma of, of a recipe. So, you know, make a tomato sauce, make it as spicy, as garlicky, as herbal as you want, um, and then use whatever fish you've got available or fish that you like. If I, I generally don't put salmon in mine, but if you have a beautiful piece of salmon and you like salmon with tomato sauce, go for it. It's, 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 it's really, it's very, it's very um, customizable um, because it was created to be customizable. It's created to use whatever you've got um, to make this great dish. And if you're in the Bay Area, check out Duarte's Tavern down in Moss Landing. It's really, really fantastic. I, I'm spacing on the name of the one that's on Fisherman's Wharf. And I know Fisherman's Wharf, it's very touristy, but there's one restaurant there that I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll get it as soon as we log off um, that has really, really fantastic chipino. But once you've made it yourself, that's the best chipino to make because it's, uh, uh, you get to make it according to your own tastes rather than the chef's. So... Scomus, no, that's not it. It's a very Italian name. I've heard of Scomus, but that, that, that's not what I was thinking about for the, um, um, for the Chipino. I'm having a senior moment. Happens more and more these days. <laughs> Any other questions? Is the uh, pit required? <laughs> uh, uh, if you have questions uh, about the dish, um, I'll give you my email, which is C K E R B Y at S B C global.net. And, um, if you have questions, um, and that's fine. I just put mine in the chat. Okay. And then, um, also if, if, uh, if you find this useful, um, uh, these kind of programs Tim has offered. He's got a very busy schedule because he's got two schools he's working with right now. Uh, he's suggested that he's willing to do vegetarian or you know what have you. Um, Anything but baking. Um, I'm not a I'm not a pastry chef, but uh... <laughs> um, a couple other very quick comments. I don't know how many of you. Um, have uh, know about this, but the Society of Alumni 
um, is experiencing its 200th birthday and, um, and quite frankly, uh, Rob tells me in the next day, we'll have an announcement about that. And it will talk about uh, most things are going to be virtual this year, um, but again, I won't, uh, you know, Rob's email and announcement will make that um, clear. One other thing is, um, let's see, uh, this month is kind of our, our food and wine month, and towards the end of the month, um, there's going to be a wine tasting, um, and if you haven't, uh, if you need a reminder about that, um, uh, you know, feel free to contact me or whomever. Uh, and let's see. Um, I think that is it. Um, in February, we're lining up programs. Joe Thompson of Mass Mocha in North Adams will be speaking about um, that. We'll get the... Okay. Uh, dates finalized and uh, uh, so those are the only comments that I have. Um, well, thanks so much, Christopher. Uh, Tim, thanks so much. I, I'm definitely gonna prepare this uh, this meal for our family. Here never, January. never tell people how easy it is. Make them think that you <laughs> close the kitchen door, pour yourself a glass of wine, listen to some music, enjoy some alone time and then come out, spritz your face with water so that they think <laughs> you've been sweating all day but never tell people how easy it is. <laughs> well, it, it definitely looks great and enjoy your lunch. Um, and then just to quickly wrap up with what Christopher had said, I think there's gonna be an announcement, an email coming out, I think tomorrow, um, and then uh, maybe some follow-ups next week. But um, yes, the celebration of the Bicentennial of the Society of Alumni is gonna kick off officially at the end of January, I think January 28th. We're gonna have a whole variety of uh, different virtual events sort of themed, uh, different themes every every month. And then hopefully, you know, we'll do virtual to start the year. And we're hoping at some point we'll be given the green light to do uh, in-person gatherings again. So we can maybe complete some celebrations toward the end of the year. So uh, with that, I just want to say thanks everybody for taking the time to join us. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you virtually and in person at some point uh, before too long. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming.